Oh, the video was the reason he testified. Ah. Okay, that's interesting. Alec Let me just Murdoch get like convicted a, a after he testified in his own defense. Yeah, the Fifth Amendment exists for a very good reason, and District Attorney Scowell will explain why. As the trial drew to a close, Los Angeles area double murder expert O.J. Simpson predicted that the Alec Murdoch jury would acquit the Low Country lawyer of double murder. It turns out that Simpson's powers of prognostication don't really work for murders he wasn't directly involved in. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if this guy beats this case. The juice was wise enough not to testify in his own criminal trial, whereas Murdoch thought that testifying in his own defense might lead to an acquittal. It's easy to see how he made that mistake. Murdoch men have been amongst the most prominent lawyers in Hampton County, South Carolina for nearly 100 years. So before I explain- It's crazy. It is crazy. We have OJ Simpson on Twitter dropping reaction videos. Giving his opinion on how another murderer could potentially beat their case. That blows my mind. Thanks, Eri Sub. Tynanic and Chris. Why the Murdoch Hail Mary play didn't work? Let's dig into the background of this disturbing case because. It it is truly bonkers. Lawyers from the Murdoch family held the solicitor position in South Carolina's 14th Judicial Circuit for 87 years. That's South a good Carolina, run. That's a a good solicitor run. is an elected official who serves as the chief prosecutor for a judicial district. A judicial district usually covers multiple counties. It's basically a district attorney, but with a seersucker suit and a southern drawl. Randolph Murdoch Sr. was elected solicitor in 1920 and served until he was killed by a freight train in 1940. Sounds like a murder. <laughs> that, that sounds like an actual old western murder where they tied him to the train tracks. Don't know the situation, it literally just sounds like he was murdered. Now, some people suspected that the freight train incident was a suicide because no one could figure out why Randolph's car stalled on the tracks, but Murdoch Sr. was succeeded by his son, Randolph Murdoch Jr., known as Buster, who held the position for 46 years cool from nickname. 1940 to 1986. During Buster's long tenure, the Murdoch family's private law firm flourished in the small town of Hampton, population 2000, because of a unique South Carolina law that allowed people to file lawsuits against the railroad in any county in the state. The Murdoch firm is referred to as the house that CSX built because they won so much money suing the railroads. Buster was known as a Good. win at all costs. That's what we needed. The South Carolina Supreme Court reprimanded Buster several times for improper jury arguments during death penalty cases. On two separate occasions, 20 years apart, he told jurors that if they didn't impose the death penalty on a criminal defendant, he would use his power as solicitor to release other rapists into the community. <laughs> yes, you heard that right. <laughs> it's hard to imagine a worse thing a prosecutor could say in court, but I'm sure prosecutors have. And he got to keep the position? He would make these threats like, okay, if he doesn't get the death penalty, five rapists will go into Gotham. He sounds like the Joker. What? How do you not, like, lose that job after the first threat? Thanks to the resub. Saturn, Abigail, Drin. Roxas in the tier one seven twelve in the prime forg and the bits Adonis. That was his dad in the seventies. Well I I know we're talking about his dad. I'm saying how did he not lose that position? Like immediately. Elected official, so he just campaigns and pays off the right people. Yeah, but I'm sure there's still systems in place where if you're threatening to release rapists out of like a uh, a grudge you can get fired. Like, you can get, like, taken out. Like, you lose your position, I would think. Because it was the 70s. It's not like rape was cool in the 70s either. I'm sure people weren't, like, it, like rallying behind him, like, Yeah, that's fucking Buster right there. That's how Buster plays. Get the death penalty. Or 50 rapists. Buster, release 50 rapists into the neighborhood. He's a tier one Momo. 
easy to cover up shit back then. True, yeah, maybe they didn't really know <laughs> exactly what was happening at the time. Maybe, yeah, that's a good point. I guess it's hard to know exactly what information was out there from these threats. It's fair to assume that the citizens of the 14th Judicial Circuit just might be intimidated by a man who threatened to turn rapists loose as revenge. When Buster was dead, Buster's son, Randolph Murdoch III, was elected solicitor and served until 2005. Now we've come full circle. Alex Murdoch, the now convicted murderer, is Randolph III's son. Alex Murdoch worked in the family law firm and also volunteered as an assistant solicitor. Alex continued his work with the solicitor's office until he himself was indicted for stealing from his clients yep. and partners in 2022. That's what my dad was talking yeah, about. Get there. So here's a, question. a lot of financial crimes, are apparently. Are the Murdochs corrupt? Well, there are open investigations into two separate suspicious Maybe deaths that are linked in, to the family. Tier one slick, in 2015, a high school the student, sheet. Stephen Smith, was found dead in the middle of a Hampton County road. There were no tire marks or debris that would suggest a vehicle crash. At least one highway patrol investigator and the county coroner ruled the death a homicide suggesting that the body was dumped on the road. A pathologist, however, concluded that Smith was likely struck by a passing vehicle side mirror. Alex's oldest son, Buster, named for his grandfather, is mentioned dozens of times in the 2015 investigation report. Whoa, Rumors wow. Locally, that Buster had been in a relationship with Smith. Alex and his brother, Randy, visited the scene and were seen going right through crime scene tape. The South Carolina State Law Enforcement Division reopened this is a lot. This is a lot. I'm, I'm going to send this to my dad. I wonder if he even knew half this shit. This is crazy. So, <laughs> his son, no saint. Hmm. My dad's going to love this one. He was glued to this trial, apparently. Okay. Thanks for your sub of Braxis and the gifts of Birdie. And the bits of Donis and Bud. The guy really had rapists in the queue to join the server. Oh, you're talking about Buster still, yeah. I don't... I'm just going to take a guess that the other Murdochs didn't use the same tactic. Opened the investigation into Smith's death after officers found new evidence during their recent investigations into Alex Murdoch. Stephen Smith was killed on Sandy Run Road back in July of 2015. Investigators say his death was originally listed as a result of a hit and run. But his mother has many questions about that ruling. Now the South Carolina Department of Law Enforcement tells WSAV that information from the Murdoch investigation has led them to reopen Smith's case. They would not say what evidence led to that decision or whether the Murdoch family was involved in any way. The second investigation. Hmm. In 2018, Alex very uneducated here i'm learning as we go i'm just gonna say his son probably did it <laughs> like I, yep uh, i'll just let it rip i think uh, his son's probably guilty that th that is very suspicious shit over there alex's housekeeper gloria satterfield allegedly tripped over alex's dogs and fell down the steps of the murdoch family's hunting lodge alex was the what only the fuck after she died from her injuries Alex told Satterfield's sons to sue him for insurance money. Murdoch referred the sons what to is his happening? college roommate, lawyer Corey Fleming. Murdoch and Fleming collaborated on the insurance settlement, but never told the brothers that they had in fact collected on two settlements, one for more than $500,000 and another for $3.8 million. Murdoch... This is crazy, huh? No, I didn't hear. I brushed her tail. Look at how much hair on her tail. Yeah, she's she's shedding, I guess. It's just her tail. It's nice. Soft. It's very soft. It looks soft. She's very soft. Yeah, she is. What are you watching? Just about a murderer oh. and his 
awful family. Mm-mm. Like <laughs> it came from her tail? Yeah, her tail. And her ass is always covered in a little poop. Oh, yeah, the shirt here. Hmm? Oh, from yesterday. That doesn't answer the question. Because I, I took it off. <laughs> hey, Tetra. Yeah, I was always got poop on her ass, usually because of her ass condition. So I imagine her tail hair has little poop particles on it. I don't want to touch that. Knew that one of the brothers, Brian, was mentally impaired and living on an annual salary of $14,000. Yet he watched as a bank foreclosed on Brian's trailer, knowing that a check from Lloyd's of London had already been deposited into Alex's own bank account. Murdoch later admitted to stealing over $4 million from the Satterfields. When a reporter uncovered the Satterfield settlement, investigators started looking for payday. other irregularities. They found that Murdoch was ripping clients off left and right. Alex Murdoch's empire of lies started to unravel in 2019. Alex and his wife Maggie had two sons, Paul and Buster. On the night of February 23rd, 2019, Paul Murdoch and his five friends spent the night partying on Paul's boat. All six of them were underage. Paul's friends called him Timmy when he was drunk because he what? seemed to have a vicious alter ego when he was wasted. When it's the what does that, that Paul mean? Drove the boat for most of the Why would they... Like a Jekyll and Hyde thing? Why Timmy, though? I think they reset odd reality in the prime. Confurious and cozy. Because he was crazy drunk. Hmm. Gotcha. I'm just, I, I think the the Murdoch lineage is bad news so far. I hadn't, uh, this is crazy. When my dad gave me like the breakdown of the trial, he mentioned nothing about his family. But there was so much goofy shit in the trial itself that I was still captivated. Apparently during the trial, the, um, there was a, a, a part where someone started like pointing a gun around when like reenacting what happened, which was weird. And also that a dog was used for evidence because there was blood on its paw. And one of the jurors got tossed out because they were like disclosing information about the case, which you can't do, obviously. And as revenge, one of the, the juror claimed that they left an entire batch of eggs in the jury or in the courthouse or something to stink it up. Like, it was wild, the shit I was hearing. And he didn't even mention any of the family stuff, so I don't even think he knows. Easy tier one. Dr. Ender in tier one. Crazy squirrel in the prime. Noddle. And there he's a bubble bowl, backwood, and give some ant. The gun was the defense pointing it and saying, tempting. Feels like a weird strategy, I gotta tell you. I mean, I didn't pass the bar, but I'm gonna venture a guess that they probably tell you that's a bit of a no-no <laughs> tactic. Is it tier one? Pubo. The night... Except for a few minutes when Connor Cook had to take over because Paul was arguing with his girlfriend, Megan Dowdy. Paul's friends say he assaulted Megan. The boat later crashed into a piling and they were all thrown from the boat. Everyone survived except for one, Mallory Beach, who was found dead a week later. After the crash, Holy Alex shit. visited Connor Cook in the hospital. Alex tried to convince Connor that Connor had been driving the boat, not Paul. Randolph Murdoch III, the former solicitor, arrived at the hospital and stopped police from questioning his grandson. Alex and his wife Maggie traipsed through the crime scene. Eventually, Paul was charged with two counts of boating under the influence with great bodily injury and one count of boating under the influence causing death. Paul Murdoch pleaded not guilty and hired a state senator who served on the Judiciary Maybe Committee the big to prepare his defense. Appreciate it. Thank but you, Paul Rod. never stood trial because he was murdered alongside his mother. 
on June seventh. What in the June fuck 7th, is happening? Is many things in Alex Murdoch's life came to a head. Jeannie Seckinger, oh wait, chief no, financial that... officer at Murdoch's law firm, confronted him about wait. money that she believed he had stolen from the firm. During the conversation, Alex received a phone call that his father's health had taken a turn for the worse. What and the he fuck? He was dying in a Savannah hospital. Seckinger stopped her questions so he could go deal with his father. Okay, uh, hold on. That's that's his. Okay, the all the names started confusing. Me. That's his wife. Okay, now now we've got to the wife and son murder. murder. I thought this was a totally different son and mother murder. It, this, this is his wife and son murder part. Okay. All of the names started to throw me for a fucking loop. There is so much, like, death from, like, his own, like, family committing crimes now. Shit. There is so much to keep up with. No, this is a different murder. No, 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 no. Uh, Maggie, 100%, was uh, Alex Murdoch's wife. And Paul was his son. The, the one that he murdered. No, this is uh, absolutely the um, wife and son murder part. This is a prime Jacob, Amicalico, and the resub few and gives a Bruce Wayne. But a short time later, she realized Alex remained in the office. That check never even came through our books. He stole it, endorsed it, and put it in his Bank of America account. And we found a copy of it on his desk. He asked her about his 401k balances, which he was worried about producing in the Beach family's wrongful death lawsuit. A hearing was scheduled in that lawsuit that could have compelled discovery of Alex's assets. The Beach family's lawyer said he planned to sue Alex and Maggie personally because they allegedly kept a beer refrigerator at the hunting lodge and underage kids were free to drink up. Given the scale of Alex's financial crimes, discovery of his assets would have revealed years of Murdoch's criminality. Later that same night, Alex allegedly found Paul and Maggie dead outside the kennels at the Murdoch's sprawling hunting estate. Alex called 911 shortly after 10 o'clock p.m. He told police that he had just returned home after spending most of the evening out. Police concluded that Paul had been shot at close range twice with a shotgun and Maggie had been shot with a semi-automatic rifle. The murder weapons have never been recovered. A firearms expert said casings found near Maggie's body were from a rifle round called 300 Blackout. After the murders, Alex told his law partners that he screwed up and would pay back some of the money he had stolen. But by September 3rd, the firm had found more financial irregularities. Later that same day, the partners- I'm getting Alex a very clear understanding of exactly what's going on now. including Alex's brother Randy, agreed to wait until September 6th to announce the resignation. But the next day, on September 4th, Alex's friend Chris Wilson confronted him as well. See, Alex owed Wilson $200,000 after lying to him about a legal settlement. So Alex admitted to stealing from Chris and blamed his behavior on an opioid addiction. And then hours later, that same day yep. after that conversation with Chris, Alex was shot in the head. Yes, seriously. <laughs> yep. Is this like a far-fetched Netflix series yet? So, I, now we're at the part that I know. Everything that preceded this, fucking wild. No clue. But now we're getting into the part that my dad was talking about, and now I'm kind of in the know on where all this goes. Chat just educated me about this, so I have the spoilers here. But I, I guess I, I won't drop the spoilers. But I, I, I see now what has happened and... Uh, how things have got to this point. On September 4th, Alex Murdoch called 911 and reported that while he was pulled over on the side of a road with a flat tire, someone had shot him. I stopped, I got a flat tire, mm -hmm. and I stopped, and somebody stopped to help me, and when I turned my back... Twad, to Link in the prime roof and Mitsuo oh, and Mo. okay, were you shot? Yes, but okay. I mean, I'm okay. Alex later admitted that he hired his cousin Eddie to shoot him <laughs> yep. so Alex's remaining son Buster could, could get the life insurance million dollar life insurance policy but <laughs> apparently cousin Eddie wasn't up to the job <laughs> because the gunshot Good picture wound was national just lampoon temporarily blinded Alex Eddie would also turn out to be Alex's oxycodone dealer <laughs> Alex later admitted that what he stole fuck? from his law partners and clients to fund his addiction to painkillers according hold to on my dad's calling me about the Murdoch shit that I just sent him with this hold on hey 
Yeah, well, did you even know about all of the Murdoch shit with his family? Like how his son is most likely responsible for deaths as well? Yes. You... you... Yeah, the boat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cause, cause, I yeah, I just got to that point. Cousin Eddie to like a hitman to shoot him for the life insurance policy for Buster. Yeah, and then and then, then they fucked that whole thing up. <laughs> okay, I didn't know if you knew any of that because you didn't mention it. That shit's crazy. Yeah, no, this is this is absolutely wild. I had no idea it was like so deep reaching. I know. That's what I'm telling you. So you think it's pretty cool, right? Well, cool is like a, probably a weird word to use for it, but like it's it's fascinating. Like it feels like it's some kind of crazy movie. Yeah. All the people in Alec Murdoch and all them. I mean, he was a piece of shit for 20 years. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, his whole his whole family dating back to the 40s was a piece of shit. Oh, I know. I know. The whole thing. And the thing about him is he thought he was like invincible. Yeah. Like, and the, the, the like his lawyer didn't want to go on the stand, but he insisted because he thought he could outsmart everybody. That's the, that's the what the video is talking about. How against the, like better judgment or uh, better advice, he still testified, which fucked him. Yeah, exactly. If he wouldn't have testified, he would have got off. But he was so cocky and so screwed up on drugs that he thought he could go up there and put on a big act because what they said was he was one of the best lawyers when it came to like defending people. Like, he would, like, act, and he could turn it on, like, in an instant. Yeah. <laughs> so many trials like that. Well, yeah, when his whole family made money suing the railroads and shit, so, yeah, I, yeah. That's what, that's what they specialized in was the railroad thing. Yeah. So, I, so, 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 I had no idea it was this wild, but, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Are you do a video on it? Well, I don't know. I'm just kind of learning about it right now from Legal Eagle, who did a really good breakdown. If you need like a, a recap, that's why I sent it to you. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I know. So, the Bucks signed Baker Mayfield. <laughs> I, I don't care about the Bucks. It's not, I, I don't. I don't care. I don't care about Baker Mayfield. I'm going to go back to watching Alex Murdoch testifying and shit. <laughs> Yeah, I don't care about the Bucks and Baker Mayfield or whatever. It doesn't matter. Yeah, that's well. He's he's got to put he's got him put in the video. So I've seen a couple of the clips. Yep. Yeah. yeah, basketball was good. Just the same crew as always, really. All right. I, I, yeah, all the same guys. All right. Yeah, yeah, he did. So uh, I'm streaming right now. So I'll I'll call you back later, and we can talk more about Murdoch. Okay, okay. Oh, I'll let him know. All right, love you. Bye. Yeah, he's really into the whole Murdoch shit. We got like encyclopedic knowledge on this whole thing apparently. He didn't even mention the family stuff, so I thought that'd be news to him. Thanks to the Prime. Not Technoblade and the Reese of Weeds, Oddball, Waterboy, Iverson, and the Bits Universal. And the Prime Lynn. Yeah, no, this whole family's rotten. Well, I haven't heard anything about the mother, so maybe she didn't do anything terrible. I have, I have no idea. 
but we're only 10 minutes and there's still plenty of room. Alex, on some days, he was taking up to 60 oxycodone pills. So Which is the crazy. The cards the prosecutors were trying to knock down. A very influential family headed by a man with an insatiable appetite for pills. The double murder of Maggie and Paul, who were mowed down on Murdoch family property, the suicide for hire insurance fraud scheme, and, oh yeah, how could we forget, 99 additional charges by the state Oof. attorney general for embezzlement, money laundering, and tax fraud. First was the trial for the murders of Paul and Maggie. The trial was fittingly in South Carolina's 14th Judicial Circuit, the very Martin. same circuit for which his family had supplied three generations of solicitors. The prosecution really wanted to use the suicide for hire plot to demonstrate that Alex had a propensity for violent schemes. Real quick though, was his plan actually to die? Like, did Alex Murdoch hire cousin Eddie, goofball McGee, red-blooded patriot fucking wild maniac to come shoot him and kill him? That's wild. So his plan was actually to die. <laughs> He said, come shoot me in the head. And then he survived. He's like, damn it. Time to change plan. Wow. Hey, a lot of things can be said about Alex Murdoch. But, God, you know, God damn it, he gave it 110%. This man was ready to literally kill himself so that way his son could still have some fucking cheated funds. $10 million life insurance policy. He's out there giving it his all. As the prosecutor said, when the hounds are at the door, when Hannibal is at the gates for Alex Murdoch, violence happens. The judge initially ruled that this incident was off limits for the criminal trial. However, during the trial, the defense asked a witness about whether it was possible that drug gangs killed Paul and Maggie. The judge then reversed himself, ruling that the questions opened the door to prosecutors introducing evidence about Alex and Cousin Eddie, mm. since Alex was admittedly associated with a drug dealer. The trial's biggest bombshell was an unsent Snapchat yes, video. Yes, this is the one that my dad was talking home. about. Alex told police he had last seen his son and wife 90 minutes before he found their bodies. He said Maggie and Paul were down at the kennels checking on the dogs. So he took a nap, watched TV, then called and left Maggie a message saying he was going to go check on his mother. Alex visited his mother and then arrived at the kennels around 10 where he found them dead. He repeatedly denied being at the kennels before he found the bodies. As it turns out, Paul filmed a Snapchat video just minutes before he was killed, showing a Labrador retriever wagging its tail. He apparently intended to send the video to his friend Rogan Gibson, whose chocolate lab was staying at the Murdoch kennels. Several witnesses testified that they could hear Alex's voice in the background of the video. Did the Snapchat video influence Alex's decision to testify on his own behalf? Almost certainly yes. The very first Well, thing yeah, and I think that is very clearly his voice in the Snapchat video. Very clearly. Things are you said, Pierre. And Alex did on the witness stand was fess up that he lied about being at the kennels. Alex admitted it was his voice on the video. Were you in fact at the kennels at 8.44 p.m. on the night Maggie and Paul were murdered? I was. Did you? So then he absolutely just admits to a lie right there. I do, I do want to point out, this man's got some wild hair coloration here. This looks like a weird slider in a Dark Souls creator. He looks like a french fry with like some cheese sauce on the top. That shit is going hard. You lie to Sled Agent Owen and Deputy Laura Rutland on the night of June 7th. I did lie to them, and I'm so sorry that I did. Other than lying <laughs> to them about going to the kennel, I was very Holy cooperative shit. in every aspect of this investigation. Very cooperative, except for maybe the most important fact of all, that you were at the murder scene with the victims just minutes before they died, Prosecutor Waters said. Uh-oh. This admission was just the tip of the iceberg that Alex was about to hit. In every criminal trial, the defendant has a constitutional right to testify or to remain silent. The right to remain silent during a criminal trial means that the jury is legally prohibited from taking a defendant's choice not to testify into account when deciding his or her guilt. 
The prosecution can't refer to the defendant's decision not to testify as an indicator of guilt. Testifying allows the defendant to tell his own story, but he doesn't get hmm. to do it unmediated. When a defendant chooses to testify, the prosecutor gets to cross-examine that defendant. It is rarely a comfortable experience for the defendant, and prosecutors love it. A defendant's testimony- Yeah, that seems like a fucking, I didn't even know that's how that worked. That seems like a fucking terrible idea ever to testify. What, like, if you could just say nothing and it can't be used against you, why would you ever testify? Unless you're, like, already losing and you think that your, uh, your testimony could somehow save it. Unless you're actually innocent. But even in that case, though, like, uh, there's a very famous video called Don't Talk to Cops, and it gives reasoning why even no matter what, even though you've done nothing, if you're squeaky clean, you should never talk to officers. And the reasoning basically boils down to the second you do, even when totally innocent, you can be worked and it can fuck you in the long run. So the optimal play is always just stay silent. No matter what. Thanks to resub profit, football, prime, wizard, audits, turquoise, the gift sub croak, and the prime Dalek. That is interesting. I didn't realize that's how that worked. It seems like doing it, <laughs> like testifying is always going to be rough. Because, well, this guy is a lawyer, I guess, in this case. But for most people, you're not lawyers. So you should just let your team talk on your behalf. Because otherwise, during cross-examination, everything can just be immediately fucked, even though you're innocent. But maybe there are cases where it works out in their favor, and I just don't know which ones those are. Who knows? I'm not an expert. I'm literally just now learning about how that functions. It opens the door to impeachment. Impeachment is just attacking someone's credibility. Impeachment can happen in a lot of ways. For example, being biased or prior and consistent statements and past criminal convictions. When a person doesn't have a criminal record to worry about or hasn't made any inconsistent statements, then testifying could be a safer proposition. Emphasis on the could be, because it's not easy to face cross-examination under any circumstances. Even a defendant with no skeletons in the closet can be yeah, he's even up. talking about this We've right now. We've seen some high-profile defendants decide to testify in their own defense to mixed results. Self-defense cases often lend themselves to a defendant's testimony. In those cases, there has to be some evidence that the defendant perceived imminent danger of physical injury, mm. and sometimes Good point. it can be hard Didn't to think show about that, that without the defendant's testimony. Kyle Rittenhouse testified that under the circumstances as he perceived them, he didn't have a choice other than to use the amount of force that he did. Rittenhouse stood up fairly well under cross-examination, and at just 18 years old, he really didn't have much in the way of a criminal history or other impeachable matters. In contrast, Elizabeth Holmes was on trial for defrauding patients, doctors, and investors by lying to them about Theranos' technology and business relationships. The subject of her trial was whether she spent years knowingly making false claims. Holmes had already given testimony under oath in civil suits and government investigations, which made testifying a dicier proposition. During her criminal trial, she blamed other people and claimed that her lies were just misunderstandings. When she said she couldn't remember the details of a certain topic, the prosecutor essentially impeached her with testimony that she had previously given to the SEC, where she certainly did remember. And the jury, of course, convicted her. Lightly, might I add, I believe she still only received 10 years. That should have been a life sentence. The shit she did should have been life. And she still got 10 years. So, testifying, I guess, to some degree, still did kind of work out for her, unfortunately. Thanks to Tier 1 Stank, Tier 1 Canola Oil, and the Resub Hulk. Soylent and Lost Souls and Squilliam and L. Yeah, she even got pregnant in order to try and push the trial further. I remember that. I've talked about that. Elizabeth Holmes is an absolute villain. Elizabeth Holmes is an evil, evil woman. Who got a very light sentence. Thanks for you dank in the tier one, Kaze. So back to Alex Murdoch. He's a lawyer with experience prosecuting and defending criminal cases. 
and also probably a narcissist. So it's not surprising that he thought he could handle himself on the witness stand. However, a defendant's credibility is absolutely crucial, which is why prosecutors try so hard to impeach. If the jury thinks the defendant is a liar, things go south quickly. And it seems like that's exactly what happened to Alex. Alex claimed that he told one whopper about his alibi, that he wasn't at the Kendalls before the murders. But other than that, he was cooperative with investigators and truthful in his testimony. But prosecutor Creighton Waters was able to show a pattern of duplicity. Quote, the second you're confronted with facts you can't deny, you immediately come up with a new lie, he said. The prosecutor was able to call out numerous lies by Murdoch. For example, what? when Murdoch's plan to get murdered by Cousin Eddie failed, he quickly created an elaborate story. While he was recovering in the hospital, he brought in a sketch artist to create a fake picture of the non-existent stranger who allegedly shot him. When Alex's brother Randy overheard Alex trying to bribe a nurse to let him use her phone, he thought it was suspicious. And brother Randy called the police <laughs> and the story began to unravel. Oh, Jesus a Christ. Sled sketch artist. <laughs> And spent Man, this guy just straight up looks her. evil. He looks actually soulless. Those are some hollow, empty devil eyes right there. A hundred percent. Sometimes people just look the part. Christ. Things he resub suck thy ball, minor, Benjamin, and tier one bond in the prime Caden and Zim. Emperor Palpatine. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Period of time with her going forward and creating an image of the supposed assailant. I did sit down with her. I, I, I was in the hospital and they came in, sat down with me, asked me a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. I answered their questions and. Yes, you did. You it sat came there. To a, it came up with a composite. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir sat there and answered their questions just as effortlessly and convincingly as you've been trying to do for the past two days. Isn't that correct? No, sir. That's, that's not true. The prosecutor also showed that Alex would say whatever was necessary to help his own case. Alex told the jury well, that, that when he found the about bodies, right. yeah. he didn't check their pulses before calling 911 because there wasn't enough time. But in an earlier statement to police, Alex claimed that when he found his family murdered, he checked their pulses and then dialed 911. The prosecutor's reconstruction of the timeline well, revealed that only 20 well, seconds passed between the time Murdoch parked his car at the kennels and when he called 911. Mm. So as soon as Alex was confronted with this seemingly impossible timeline, he came up with a new, new story. The prosecutor asked Alex if he killed his wife and child. When asked if he knew who did it, Alex also said no. But in an earlier interview with investigators, Alex had actually implicated his groundskeeper. He also told the jury that someone angry about the death of Mallory Beach what? committed the murders. These inconsistencies undermined Alex's credibility. Then there's the mess with Alex's financial crimes. The prosecution argued that Alex's financial crimes couldn't be separated from the murders because exposure of his vast financial crimes yeah, was one of the motives speaks to his characters. And Paul. Well, not only that, I imagine that also helps to demonstrate, like, make a like a character profile, right? You, I don't know if that is actually something that's usable in court. But doesn't that also serve to poke holes in the credibility since all of these financial crimes hinged on a bunch of lies and embezzlement and all of that? Or is that not allowed? Thanks, you said Papa Cat. Yes, for the jury. Okay. Okay. I, I, I figured, because it'd be silly not to, right? Like, you'd need to talk about the financial crimes, even though they are clearly one of the motives. Even if it wasn't necessarily a motive, I still feel like that's pertinent to the case. Since he's making a testimony, you need to be able to trust him as a person, like his character. So his financial crimes should be able to showcase, like, eh, this isn't exactly a reliable narrator on things, right? At least I would think. The defense countered that the financial crimes had nothing to do with the murders and that the prosecution lacked proof that the two were related in any way. During direct examination, Alex explained that he committed a lot of financial crimes because of his drug addiction. 
Alex's lawyers portrayed the admission of wrongdoing as a willingness to come clean. They argued that a person who admits to lying isn't necessarily a person who commits violence, which is true in a general sense. However, was it a good strategy in this particular case to admit to years of financial fraud? Not really. On cross-examination, <laughs> the prosecution scored several key points. Prosecutor Waters held up a stack of papers relating to clients whom Alex stole from. Quote, every single one of these, you had to sit down and look someone in the eye and convince them that you were on their side when you were not. Wow, that's correct. hardball. Do you remember it, even one of them? If you ask me questions, but I, I can't, I can't remember sitting down with Dion. Alex's response, what I admit is I misled them. I did wrong and that I stole their money. What Prosecutor Waters was getting at was this. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Alex Murdoch is sitting there and looking at you and Damn. you of something, but you shouldn't believe him. Just look at how he lied in the past. That's Moreover, strong Alex as fuck. That all of his financial bad deeds were caused by his drug habit, which was costing him as much as $60,000 a week. Who put this thing together? Me, that's who. But maintaining his drug habit and hiding his financial crimes could have motivated him to violence. Especially since he already admitted to a suicide for hire plot to funnel money to his surviving son. Finally, Alex has now confessed to several of the 99 indicted financial crimes. He's accused of stealing about $8.8 .8 million, including embezzling about $3.7 million in 2019 alone. If he had That's to quite a bit. all of his financial Jesus. fraud, ripping off disabled clients, stealing money from a dead housekeeper's sons, would what? have been front and center in this case. After both sides rested, it was the jury's turn to deliberate. And to be fair, there were weaknesses on both sides. The prosecution didn't find the two murder weapons. They didn't have any direct witnesses to the murders, and they lacked forensic evidence that juries sometimes look for in this age of CSI, a tier one like a victim's blood on the, the defendant's Risa clothes. Prosecutors guessed crow that the pair were killed at around 9 p.m., beat. but they couldn't pinpoint a time of death with certainty. The alleged motive could also have struck some jurors as kind of weak. While murdering someone to cover up a lesser crime is not unheard of, killing your own wife and son over some financial crimes it could be a bridge too far. And since the prosecution claimed that Cousin Eddie left drugs for Alex near the kennels, the defense speculated that Eddie or Eddie's dealer friends may have been the real culprits. But these gaps in the prosecution's case are to be expected. Slam dunk prosecution cases often don't go to trial. And whatever weaknesses the prosecution may have had, the defense had vastly more. Alex said all of his bad deeds were caused by his drug habit. But maintaining his drug habit and hiding his financial crimes could have motivated him to violence, especially since he already admitted to a suicide for hire plot to funnel money to his surviving son. Yeah, I feel like the that's just a nail in the coffin. It shows that he's willing to like, A, die, or B, have someone killed, kill. It's, it's violent. Right? Like, I feel like that is just truly a, a home run of evidence. Like, the importance of that to this can't be understated. And I mean, I guess it worked clearly. You got two life sentences, but still, I feel like that should have just been so fucking free right there. Things of the Prime, uh, the Resub Sky and the Prime Yeet and the Resub Fabi and Saint. They figured out that he'd have to be doing 50k worth of drugs a week to spend all that money. Bruh, popping 60 oxys a day? That sounds like he probably was at 50k <laughs> like a week somehow. Exit tier 1, swamped in the prime. Gabe. He's a prime cucumber. That's a month's prescription in a day. <laughs> yeah. Nah, that man was fucking popping those oxys like M&M's apparently. He's a prime. Kemp and Shaboy. Lawyer Chris Tinsley testified at trial that he intended to sue Maggie and Alex personally, which could have resulted in a huge verdict that would have destroyed their wealth. He gets up close in my face and says, hey, Bo, what's this I'm hearing 
about what you're saying. Uh, if you don't think I can burn your house down and I'm not going to do everything you're wrong, you need to settle this case. So I took it as he tried to intimidate me. He didn't intimidate me uh, and, and sort of bully me into backing off. As for the weapons, prosecutors said casings for bullets from a 300 blackout rifle were found near Maggie's body. And the Murdochs owned a rifle chambered in 300 blackout, and the weapon is now missing. Alex also couldn't account for the clothing he was wearing on the day of the murders. His clothes had never been found. His mother's caregiver testified that after the murders, Alex tried to remind her about what he was wearing. I guess it's easy in hindsight, but I feel like even if I was in the court as this was unfolding, the second it came to that point, both of those in conjunction, I'd be like, well, he fucking did it. <laughs> what kind of coincidence is that? Oh, so they were killed with 300 blackout rounds. Oh, you have a weapon with 300 blackout. That's a weird coincidence. Can you bring it in so we can just make sure like everything's, you know, all good? Oh, it's missing. Well, what happened to it? Oh, you, you don't know. Oh. Okay, well, what about your clothes? Can we, uh, your, like the clothes you were wearing on that night, maybe they picked up some forensic evidence from the real killers. Oh, you lost your clothes. Are you telling me a burglar came in in the middle of the night while you were sleeping and took the fucking clothes off your back? Even your dirty goddamn undies, he took them? Oh. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> this is so, this is outrageous. He also tried to convince her that she misremembered the amount of time he spent with his mother that night. He said, you remember the shirt I was wearing, that Vinnie Vine shirt. Those were, that's what he said to me. I don't remember that. I don't remember him wearing that shirt that day. Alex said he was there for about 50 minutes. The caregiver told the police it was 10 to 20. All told, this is a case where Alex Murdaugh had to take the stand. Alex previously told police that he had not been to the kennels before the murders. The prosecution was able to prove through that Snapchat video that he almost certainly was. Under those circumstances, Alex had to explain the inconsistency himself. His defense attorney couldn't massage those facts or explain them away. Alex had to do what plenty of defendants have tried in the past. I lied about this, but I'm telling the truth about that. Impossible. By itself, that's not impossible. No, that is impossible. Is everything else. <laughs> All of Alex's financial crimes and the suicide for hire scheme and his credibility was shot. His testimony ended up sounding like something else entirely. I lied about this and I'm lying about that. The speed of the jury's verdict, just three hours of deliberation oh, after nice. a trial lasting a month and a half That's a gold split. speaks volumes. Yeah. The day after the verdict was read, Alex Murdoch was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences for murdering his wife and son. Rightfully so. Yeah, Agreed. credibility in front of a judge or jury is everything. Whether you're a lawyer or a defendant, your credibility what is often all you have. What a fucking story. What an adventure. You never get it back. It's been fascinating to watch all the crazy twists and turns in the Murdoch case. And one thing that has helped keep track of everything is today's sponsor, Morning Brew. Because Holy that's my favorite shit. way to catch up with pop culture Thanks and news. In fact, they've been the covering Prime the Murdoch Viking trial for weeks Blade. now. When I wake up, Morning Brew is the first thing Oof. that I read. I've actually been subscribed to Morning Brew for forever. It's one of my absolute favorite newsletters. And I'm thrilled to tell you why. Because Morning Brew, if you didn't already know, what happened is to a cousin free Eddie? daily newsletter. That's a great Monday question. I'm going to look it up while he's doing the sponsor. Business, finance, tech, and law in just five minutes. And it provides a fantastic quick summary of the most important issues while being witty, irreverent, and informative. And did I mention it's completely free? This week, I learned all about ChatGPT on college campuses, Amazon backing out of building HQ2 because, you know, they're firing lots of people instead, and Chris Rock's new stand-up special. He was part of the Basically trial. exactly the mix of news that I'm actually interested in and the stuff that I didn't even know I wanted to know about. And it's all written in a hilarious style. Morning Brew is one of the few emails that I actually open every single Single day. So, Legal Eagles, this one is a complete no-brainer. Morning Brew is completely free, and it takes less than. He's right now in custody on charges, on including lying right to police and owning a firearm. To get Morning Brew for free, and not only will you get a newsletter that you'll actually read, you'll actually help out this channel too. So, click on the link below to get Morning Brew. That's right the most away. recent update. And after that, click on this link over here for more Legal Eagle, or I'll see you in court. As always, fucking amazing work from Legal Eagle. What an incredible breakdown. Make sure to smash that like button, thumbs up, ring the bell, tell your mom I said hi.